Come on out to the Bungalow Bar, located at 377 Beach 92nd Street in Rockaway Beach, New York. Located right on the corner of Beach 92nd Street and Beach Channel Drive. Come and enjoy our choice of dine-in service with beautiful views of Jamaica Bay and a breathtaking sunset view. Or enjoy our takeout service and no contact delivery as well. Either way you decide to dine, you will be satisfied with our famous American style cuisine, great drinks and great service. Brought to you by IGC Hospitality, the staff at Bungalow Bar hope to see you real soon. Now, enjoy your scheduled program. Buck! Big Apple Elevator Service is a 24-hour, 7-day-a-week, family-owned and operated elevator maintenance and repair company. We'll provide you with the best service possible with a one-hour response time for any trouble calls you may have. We also perform all Category 1 and 5 tests that are required in New York and clear any existing violations so your elevators are safe and up to code. Call 212-279-0700. 212-279-0700. When the cameras aren't rolling and the spotlight is off, what are your favorite celebs really like? This is Buck the System, the podcast that peeks behind the curtain, under the covers, and brings you along as host Buck Gritano exposes real reality. We started with the captains of the smash hit TV show Wicked Tuna. How cool is that? And every time we buck the system, we have an awesome time doing it. So now, let's have some fun. You ready? Buckle up and let's go. Hey, welcome everybody. Buck the System back on this Thursday night with a special guest from Wicked Tuna, Outer Banks. Uh, season 7, actually, they're up to, Brian. Uh, welcome, I'm Buck Rotano and co-host here, Brian Fox. Welcome you to Facebook Live. And this week's guest from Wicked Tuna, Outer Banks, and it's a little bit different because he's usually the champion, the guy that's on top. He's the guy that's... Uh, usually at the top of the leaderboard this year is a little struggling, but I think he can make a comeback as the quota doesn't end. We hope it doesn't end. But let's bring him on here. Captain, welcome aboard our, our vessel, Buck the System, Captain Greg Mayer. What's up, Greg? Hey, Buck, how's it going? Thanks for having me on. Ah, oh, come on, man. Definitely thank you for coming on. Uh, this season is a little bit different season for you guys, man. You guys are in the middle of the board, but people know in Facebook, uh, talking about Facebook, people know uh, the show is pretty much a contest. It is a contest between the North and the South. That's why I like Out of Banks. We had recently, we had Zach and Daniel on the show. Uh, Ro- the Rasta Rocket crew, which the Pocket Rocket, whatever you want to call the guys. I love the guys. The guys are really hot. They're fishermen. Oh. Good bunch of guys, man. They work their ass off. Of the boat. They're out there every day. every day. They can get there. They get killed. You know, we the weather down here in the winter just kills them. They can't get out all the time. They need a bigger rig. Them guys are totally awesome, and they were cool. Uh, they yeah, actually, you gotta get into the mic. But they usually, um, they showed us how uh, the fishing and the thing works down there. Their boat, how to get it done. Uh, hospitality, I guess the Southern hospitality is a big thing down there in Carolina, I guess, the Outer Banks. Last episode, your former first mate, which is interesting, last episode of Two Back, brought them aboard. They were freezing their ass off in the middle and brought them aboard for a fried chicken meal. So you've seen uh, the hospitality. It's all not like uh, UFC fighting with uh, big, you know, with uh, Bobby Ert and um, Tyler. Not all that choking out stuff, but... And we all we're all working together. I mean, we talk. Everybody talks. We all work together. You know, those guys on the rocket this year when they when they were um, fishing, I was tied up at the fishing center where where I always tie up, and they would run their boat down there on the trailer and launch right there behind the fishing center. And every single morning, they would call me. You know, we would go out together. They'd follow me out. You know, you don't always see that on the show, but when there's guys down there that are trying to go out and make a living and go fishing. We're all working together. We're all helping each other out. You know, I, I, I help Tyler out. I'm not a big Tyler fan, but you know, when it comes down to it with information, we're all working against each other, but we got to work, work with each other because every little bit of information helps you catch more fish. Um, and you got to give what you get, you know, that's, that's, that's the thing. And it's funny. But I think we, Dave got we're caught. We're all, we're Dave. all helping each other out all the time. I think Dave was caught off guard by that the first time he came down there. Like, I, you know, because everything is me, me, me up there, you know, and, and he comes down there and everyone's helping each other. And he was like, this is weird, you know. It, it, it was definitely odd for Dave. But the, the thing is, 
you know, when you're fishing in New England, in New England, you're up there and you're fishing on spots. And the more boats you get on the spot or in the area, it shuts the fishing down. For us, the fish are moving all over the place. I mean, and, you know, we kind of have a trend. We, we can figure out the trend where they are and you get there the next morning or, you know, the, in the afternoon, you figure out where they're going to move to. But you listen to all the boats around you talking about getting a bite, marking fish, and you put it all together. And that's how you succeed. I mean, nobody can go out there by themselves and just go fishing and say, you know, screw these guys. I'm going out there. I'm going to put carrot by the camera. Um, I'm going to go out there and catch fish by myself. I don't need them. You know, we all need the information. We all help each other out. And, you know, sometimes you're not directly helping someone, but you put a little bit of information out there and it helps somebody out. I mean, it's, it's part of it. Now, is the, is the movement of the fish between north and south that much different, though? Does that have to do with the water? Is there some sort of a reason behind that? It's completely different. Um, it seems like the fish up north go to um, different areas, different ledges, and they hang out there. And they, they kind of stay in an area because of the bait. And you can almost pattern the fish. They're, they're swimming in a big, you know, I don't know swimming in a circle, but it seems like they're swimming in a big circle. They've got a pattern, you know, like a deer going through a field. You, you know that they're coming through at this time in the morning and going through in the afternoon in, in a different direction. The, the tuna do the same thing up there. It seems like they're always kind of moving around, and then it takes something, whatever it is, to make a bunch of fish move. Um and, and that happens up there a lot. You know, those fish are all, like I say, in one area, and you stay right with them. Here, it's the Gulf Stream. Um, the Gulf Stream moves in and out. The fish are staying in the stream. They come inside the cold water and feed. But at some point during the day, they're going to be in the stream. They're going to be in hot water. And that's when we find them. That's generally when we find them. But it can change. The fish can move 20 miles overnight. And... There's not really a bottom structure per se that's going to hold them. It's all about water. And, you know, we'll look at satellite shots. We'll talk to long line boats. We'll, we'll talk to other boats that are out there. And from that, you kind of figure out where they're going to be in the morning. You guys just getting out, Sometimes getting out to, to, to the inlet. I mean, just getting out the inlet, you guys start off right off the bat. It seems like it's uh, it could be very dangerous. I mean, nice for the surfers. I guess that are down there in North Carolina waiting this for the big surf, but to bring your boats through there, man. And I've seen, like, um, Dave and other people take a little bit step back, but you guys seem to know know the water as well and know when to go. It's like almost knowing when to paddle out in a big wave. Uh, can you explain what that whole situation is for somebody who doesn't know what the Oregon Inlet is? Well, the thing is... Most inlets up and down the East Coast have got a, a rock jetty on either side. So you've got a really narrow channel, and you go right through it. We don't have that. We've got a big, wide, open river delta, essentially. I mean, all the water from the Albemarle Sound is pushing through there. And as it, goes, as it pushes through, it, it moves the sand around. Then you've got current coming down the beach. So all of that Instead of having a controlled environment to go out of, we have a very out-of-control environment. And the water is going to seek its own. It's always going to find a channel. It's going to find a way out. And the channel moves. It can move uh, over the, for example, over the last seven years of the show. Um, the, sh the channel that we were running out versus where we are now has shifted about a half mile to the south. Wow. Hmm. Um, but in that time, it shifted north and it shifted south and it shifted back and forth. And if you're not going through there every day, you don't know what it's going to be. And for us, we're fishing every day. We're fishing all year round. And once again, information, all the boats that are going are telling everybody where, where the channel is. Um, before, the, the one main thing we had, you know, you saw where Griff and marciano crashed into the bridge that year was absolutely horrible the main span that we could go through there was no water in there hmm. the water the channel had actually shifted south about four probably 400 yards and the only place you could go through where we had enough water 
was too low for the boats. So we had to take our riggers down. We had to take our green stick down. And now instead of going through a spot that's 150 foot wide, we're going through a spot that's 50 foot wide. Wow. That's scary. 40 foot wide. There, there's no dredging down there? You guys, there's no like, um, there, like there they don't. There, there's dredging, but the main problem with dredging is the Army Corps of Engineers controls the equipment. They've got very limited assets to work with, to, to do all the inlets. They've got the Curatuck, they've got the Merritt, they've got the Merton, you know, two hopper dredges, one side caster. Um, and those three pieces of equipment run up and down the coast. They run up there to Montauk, um, and then they run down to Florida. Um, so... In order to get them here at Oregon Inlet, we'd have to spend a lot of money to keep them yeah. here. Right. But even though we have the money to get the inlet dredged, their assets are spread so thin, they're working other places, and they just can't put the time in here. It's true because <laughs> we, we live in Rockaway Beach, right? And I know this summer has been uh, – our beach is probably a quarter of the factor it usually is. Uh, so I know that – I grew up on the dredging, man. We, we It was a the thing. They, they dredged. Uh, but I, they stopped doing it for a while. So now I get an understanding it runs up and down the East Coast. So what affects us getting our inlets or our beaches, uh, you know, it's... It's all, it's all about budget. It's about the government's yeah. budget. And there's... I mean, you see the, you see what's going on with the, with the country right now. There's money getting spent in different places that we're not very, very high on the priority. I mean, that, and that's the bottom line. And who knows you where know, it's coming from. It, <laughs> If somebody said, "All right, look, we've got to get this inlet dredged. We got to let these people work," you know, Oregon Inlet has six hundred and sixty million dollars worth of commerce going through it every year. Wow. And you would think, with a number like that, with the amount of boats that are coming through, that they would spend the money for dredging and make sure it's safe for everyone. Well, or, or, add they, in, or add, or add, add on um, some jetties too, right? But add jetties or add the, the proper. So you guys would be safer, man. Especially jetties are a tough issue. They they approved jetties probably, I think it was fifty years ago. They approved wow. jetties at Oregon Inlet, but they had a study. So over the last fifty years, they've spent millions and millions, ends of millions of dollars, studying the impact of jetties. So basically, <laughs> kill a turtle or you kill a bird, you can't build, you can't build anything. In the meantime, we lose boats every year in the inlet because it's not a safe passage. Wow. You know, it's our, it's our highway to go to work. And, you know, if I live in the middle of a dead-end road or at the end of a dead-end road in Raleigh and there was a mudslide that closed the road off and I was the only person that lived on that road, they would open the road up. They'd repave it. They'd make sure it was safe. They'd make sure I could get out. You know, here we are, a bunch of guys trying to make a living. You know, there's hundreds and there's there's thousands of people in Oregon Inlet that are trying to make a living and we can't get the road open to the to go to work I mean that's that's the simplest analogy there is wow. you know you can pass, you can pass by it most of the time but there's a lot of times that you can't have you thing. how did you guys deal with um the COVID I mean I know the guys up north in Gloucester they had a lot of problems with the COVID how did it affect you guys down there it, it's funny because um, I was booked with charters. You know, as soon as we stopped filming, I, I had charters. And we sailed a few in March. And we were out there one day, and one of the captains got a text from his wife. And he got on the radio, and he said, they've closed the bridges. He, and we're, we said, what do you mean? Well, uh, for the virus, they closed the bridge. I mean, we're, we're, we're not an island. We're a barrier island. Um, but not technically an island, but... There's, the only way you're going to get here is by boat or by bridge. And there's two bridges that come in here. The state decided, or the county actually decided that we don't want anyone in here. We're going to quarantine right here. Nobody's allowed to come or go. We're closing the bridges down. And and they did. Um, so what happened is all the charters I had booked were all coming from elsewhere. So they couldn't get, they couldn't even get here. Um, there were a handful of people that were already here. There were some people that, um, like non-resident property owners, property owners that actually were staying down here during the whole thing. And I took a few of them fishing, uh, but the majority of our charters come from somewhere else. So 
you could not actually get people here. So we were shut down. I mean, completely shut down. And it didn't open up again until, March, until May 22nd. Wow. So it was a good solid two months. In those two months, I canceled 30 charters. And I probably would have had a handful more to run. You know, just once the fishing starts, we'd pick it up. But, I mean, that, that's that's a big chunk of our income. You know, we're, we're charging, you know, a pretty good chunk of change to go fishing every day. And to cut out 30 or 40 percent of my trips over the course of the year, that's tough. Are you are you actively doing charters right now? But it was fun. Oh, yeah, we're fishing every day. You know, weather permitting, we're fishing every day. Um, it's funny because once the once they opened up and let people down here, most every charter boat was fishing every day. And, I mean, not to downplay the virus, but for the amount of people that we've seen, you know, several, probably 100 to 200 charter boats with six people on them every single day, nobody in the fleet has gotten sick. And I think a lot of that is because, you know, you're starting to break up. Wearing a all right, we're breaking we, up a you know, Every bit. day okay, when a customer, we wipe the whole inside down and, and sanitize everything. So it's, you know, it's, it affected us a lot, but, you know, end of the year, I think we'll be okay. Uh, I think it affected a lot of people in, in all industries. We live up in New York. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of breakthrough. You're hearing a lot of, like, scratching yeah. and stuff like that. So hopefully it's coming through on the Facebook side. But give us a thumbs up if you hear us clear enough, please. Um, I know that the, the COVID virus has definitely... Um, our town of New York City, you know, Rockaway Beach, it's like, it felt like a ground zero. So I can't think anybody could say, and you didn't say that, that it's not for real. Because we, I mean, it is a real thing. But I guess different areas didn't get affected as much. I know up north, they pretty much the same thing. They couldn't get any boats out or any, any people. But I think when people on TV, they watch you and they, they believe that you guys make a million dollars on TV, right? Uh, you guys are on National Geographic. <laughs> Um, you guys are the only seven boats that are going out the inlet, right? It's just, it's just like a fantasy world a lot of times with this TV show that you take as a, it's a living for you. Uh, it supplies your the roof over your head, uh, everything, the clothes on your kids, whatever you know, whatever, 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 whatever it is. You know what I mean? But at the end of the day, they look at it as this fantasy world. That's got to be a little tough too, right? I mean, taking you're on the top and you're on the top for so many years. You won what? How many years? Four years, I think it is down there or something yeah. like that so four years then you see you on the bottom these people look at look at it like it's almost like a fantasy world how do how is your social media look like sometimes when people you know take it as tv not not a living <laughs> well, well it's funny because it's uh, and and people see it as a hundred percent accurate and it, it, i mean it we catch the fish we think we catch. We get paid for the fish we catch. And, you know, at the end of the year, we all make a little bit of money. There's no question about it. But um, when, I mean, it's harder to say because a lot of things. It's funny, man. I National Geographic. It, um, it just broke out. Hold on one second. One second, Greg. You got Greg uh, Mayer on. Uh, it just broke out. As you were saying something, went, it's almost like uh, Nat Geo is a. Uh, Checking us out over here, so they don't want you to say too much. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, it's. I mean, but it, it, the thing is, we're, we're going out there fishing, we're catching fish, we're making money, and you know, we are providing for our families and our crews and everything else. And you know, that's not a hundred percent of what we do. Um, you know, for me, th that tuna fishing fills in two months of the year for me. In the 10 months of the year, I'm making a living as a charter boat captain. I've run a boat for 20, 20 plus years out of here. Um, and I've got a reputation. I've caught fish. I've got a good clientele. And we stay busy every year. And the, sh the shows help that immensely. I mean, we filled in all of our open spots are, are filled in now. And it's a great experience. It's wonderful. I mean, it's, you know, anybody who said they wouldn't want to do it, if you've got a charter boat business, it's lying. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. You see, every day we get questions about the show. You know, I get, I get people who get on the boat and they ask about, 
you know, this season and when you did this and they, when you did that. And they ask about dot com, they ask about Marciano, ask about Tyler, ask about TJ, you know, they all want to know who the guy is that they see on TV. Sure. And it's kind of cool. It really is. It, it's fun. It's fun to see people's reactions, you know. Come on, that's got to be awesome, man. Anybody wants to be approached and, and 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 what is it like? Not just loved or stroked or whatever it is. It comes with the territory. I mean, that's what we, we're built that way as human beings, man. Uh, we see somebody famous, we run over to them, uh, Robert De Niro, for say, right? Or who's the guy that you went to see uh, that you t- want to take a picture with? And he turned around and goes, uh, "I'm with my family. I'm with my family." Oh, Jonah Hill. Jonah Hill, little jerk. Show you, <laughs> man, or whatever. But well, I thought he was cool. But I mean, yeah, but you know that's tough. But you gotta you gotta realize that you know everybody's got a life and and I, I mean a really good example I, I just moved to South Nagsend and I've got a rental house directly in front of me. The guy who does the maintenance maintenance on there is a customer of mine. He's fishing with me, um, and the people actually emailed me and they said, you know, we're staying in the house ahead of you. And the maintenance guy said that if we want to get a T-shirt, we come down and see you. And I said. That's great, thank you. I said, but this is my home. I'm at my boat every single day. I don't leave until I'm cleaned up, until the people are gone. I'm there until six o'clock every day. And then guess what? I check out. And when I check out at home, I'm home. Leave me alone. Um, if I'm out at a restaurant, out of the bar, you know, I see people all the time, stop, take a picture. You know, it's fun. Um, and I mean, I genuinely really, I mean, the kids are the best. You see kids all the Absolutely. time. They're like, Oh my God, wow. You're like the greatest thing in the world. Um, but you know, you need a certain amount of privacy, but we're on a TV show. So when, when you're out there in public, yeah, yeah, just, yeah. You, you signed yeah. up for it, man. You definitely signed up for wicked tuna. I mean, out of banks. Can we talk about, let's go back, uh, Greg to the days where you were young, Greg, before captain days, how did you get into fishing? Was fishing in your blood, your family? Yeah. Um, well, my dad was an electrician. Um, it wasn't like we ever fished for a living. But we always had a small boat. We always went fishing. I did. We did a lot of striper fishing, a lot of fluke fishing. Um, I was fortunate enough that my, my family had a um, piece of property on Manasquan River that had a dock. You know, my grandfather had... I don't know when he bought it. He probably bought it in the 40s, but he bought this giant piece of property that went from, you know, the main road. It stretched down probably, I'll say about a third of a mile to the river. And he had the lot on the river. Then he had his lot with his house. We had a great big pool there, which was awesome. Um, And we used to, like, my brother and I would ride our bikes down there and hang out all summer long, you know. Right over there, hang out at the pool, hang out at the river. We had a little boat. We could do anything we wanted. We would ride up and down the river. And it's, I mean, it's not this big, gigantic river by any stretch of the imagination. Manasquan River. But when you're a little kid and you get to just get on the boat and go, it was awesome. That was, uh, that was I'm going to cut you off, but that was the Broad Channel kids, like uh, TJ Ott and his family. <laughs> They grew, up, they grew up with boats, the, with the yep. ones with the back engine, jumping around Jamaica Bay. My mom told me if I got on the boat with one of them kids from Broad Channel, she would beat my ass. Yep. Don't I go on the boat, but you're driving. I understand you're driving around as a kid. I mean, that's, all, that's every kid's dream, so. Yeah, I mean, we, we, didn't, have, we didn't have money. My dad, my dad was an electrician. Um, but we had a place to go. We had a place to hang out. We had a little boat, and we made the best of it. Um, and it was awesome, you know, being a kid and, and knowing that I look at kids now, there's not a whole lot of places they can do that. You know, there's so much, there's so many people looking over your shoulder and you can't let your kid go out. You got to watch this guy, got to watch that guy. You know, we never had that. We had open, you know, we could do whatever we wanted. Yeah. The kids are stuck on video games now. They're stuck on video games. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we, we just ran. It was great. Um, <laughs> but that, I mean, that, that was that was a childhood that I would hope anyone could experience. But, you know, we were really, really fortunate to have it. You know, I realize that now when, when I meet people from all around the world that, that have 
um, you know, they like the fish. I'm like, oh man, I, you know, I, I bought my first fishing rod when I was 19, and I went to the tackle store and I tried to figure out what people were doing. I went to the beach over here where the guys were catching fish, and for me, it was we had a boat, we went fishing, we just figured it out, and it was awesome. You know, as a kid. So it's all like second nature now, you know? So how did you take it from the river, that little river of yours, to the ocean and, and becoming, you know, tours, having tours and having uh, the opportunity to go on Wicked Tuna? How did that approach? I mean, years, you guys must have took it to, bought a boat and went out and started chartering. How did that happen from being a kid, <laughs> wasn't, you know? It wasn't that simple. Um, no, I, when I was 14, my first... Um, my first job was working on a headboat. I was working at Bogan's Basin in Brielle um, on a half-day fluke boat. I mean, the first the first trip I made was on an all-day bluefish boat. I didn't like it. I went. They had they had four boats. They had uh, an all-day bottom fish boat, all-day fluke boat, half-day fluke boat, and an all-day bluefish boat, all day and all night bluefish boat. And I went to the half-day boat, and I stayed on there for oh god. I think I worked five or six years on there. I mean, I was the kid. I had to clean out. I had to clean out the head. <laughs> <laughs> now, now a lot of the kids in the neighborhood had jobs like this too. In your neighborhood, no. this is like somewhere you would get the jobs from. No, no, it's not. Nope, not at all. My so brother I and I, my brother and I were like, "Let's. What are we gonna do this summer? Let's go fishing." And we went down and we talked to two or three different places, and. I took the job. I I, I wrote out the first day. I mean, part of. You know, we get people all the time and ask about, well, how do you get a job on a boat? Well, you show up at 4 o'clock in the morning, you throw ice every day, day in, day out, day out. You show up in the afternoon, and then eventually you're going to meet the guys. They're going to like you. They'll give you a chance to go right out, and then you might get a job. And that's what I did. I mean, I was 14 years old. I was like, oh, well, let me go down there and find out what it's all about. And they said, all right, come on. Let's come fishing today, and here's 100 pounds of squid. Got that, and at the end of the day, it's like here you got to clean ahead. And the the funniest thing that Kevin Bogan ever said to me, he's like, "You don't need a brush to clean ahead. All you need is a matchbook." I said, "What do you mean a matchbook?" He goes, "That's how you clean the shit out from underneath your underneath your nails when you're done cleaning." Ahead. <laughs> you know, and that and that's how I was raised. I mean, yeah, I was yeah. raised to do. I was a low man on the totem pole. You went to work. You did the job, and. It, you know, I worked there for, like I say, five or six years. And then from there, it just kind of snowballed. I got on a private boat. I got another private boat, got on a charter boat. And, you know, you, you build a network, um, and and that's how it works. And, and now here I am down the Outer Banks. It's funny because you think of people that see you on social media. They think, uh, are you looking? Are you looking? How many times you got this one, Greg? Are you looking for any mates? Uh, come down. I work because you're on the show already, man. Because I see it on up north with the other guys from up north. They when they post something on Facebook, like, oh, you're looking for a first mate. You're looking for that. Like it's easy to jump in. You don't have to take the steps to become, you know. Where you got, man? You got to clean the shit. It's like anything. I mean, thank God right. your brothers didn't say, uh, we we're going to work this summer. Have a McDonald's or Walmart, and you could have been like the CEO of Walmart or whatever right now, <laughs> or general manager of the hunting s section. I don't I don't know. Yeah. It's but pretty it, funny. I mean, it's, it's funny because I get that all the time. I get people like, you know, I'm, yeah. I'm willing to work. You know, I, I did this. I worked here. I worked there. I'm, you know, I'm willing to work. I want to come down. Can I ride out? It's like, well, no, you can't ride out because people are paying me $2,000 a day to charter my boat. And it's a business. And I don't just take people out riding out because you want to be there. Um, and like I said before, if you want a job, you show initiative. And the initiative is you're there every day. You know, yes, it yeah. doesn't make a difference that you, you know, that you can't. That you have another job. You, you have another job. You want to do this. Well, well, you got to just do it. You got to show up. You got to uh, do it. And I, we get people all the time. Oh, man, I want a job. I fish with this guy. I fish with that guy. I, I'm really looking forward to doing it. What do I need to do? Show up every day. And they'll show up for two days, and that's it. Never see him again. And it happens all the time. Greg, do you Greg. do you do you um, love turtlenecks? Somebody's asking, do you love turtlenecks? You must be talking to Tyler. No, I have, <laughs> no, I have it's mock, actually Bubby. I have mock tees that I wear a lot. They're, it's Tyler. 
No, it's or Bobby. Bobby. It's Bobby. Yeah, it's Bobby. It's Bobby. <laughs> Yo, it's funny, man. These guys are <laughs> these guys are great, man. These guys, I appreciate I that. Like my, it's winter time. I'm up on the bridge. I'm not sitting in the cabin in my pelagic shorts, there, Bubby. Um, <laughs> Bubby can cook his ass off, but man, he can cook. I seen him on the back of that uh, Weber grill, man, making hamburgers and all that. You guys got to get him he on. Does. He does. You know, buddy, hey, you got to remember, we got Chef Dirty though. Okay. Dirty cooks every where, day. Where, now, where does the name awesome. Dirty? Where does the name Dirty come from? That's not. I don't want that guy cooking. I mean, I'm sorry. I know. I know he's good. <laughs> you know, Dirty's on the grill. Man. This doesn't sound right. Oh, <laughs> uh, you have no idea. It's something skateboard, but he was Dirty J the pimp, and it's oh. that was from damn thirty years. He's the pimp. It's funny because he's saying. The best it's kind of He's one of the man. best men in the business. He that could work, work with a bunch of plumbers, a bunch of firemen that show up, or you work with a bunch of Wall Street guys. He will make them all feel at home. That's he awesome. does an awesome job. And I said, I see you and smile. And once you mention his name, man, Dirty, he gets down and dirty. He's the pimp. We're going to have Greg Nice uh, on. I don't know if you know hip hop, any hip hop, but back in the day, he's nice and smooth. Did a song with Big Daddy oh. Kane. And, he, oh, yeah. and pimping ain't easy, so I mean, yeah, I didn't even know what a pimp was back then. But he's still gonna punch Bubby in the mouth. Uh oh, Bubby, <laughs> Bubby, Bubby! I know Bubby's listening. Yeah, he's good. They're good people, man. They're really good people. I'm so happy, happy that they actually won up north finally, and they're giving you guys the run for your money down here. And this season, it seems kind of weird. How does it look? I know that you have to take yourself into this season. I think it's episode 13 or 14, right? We're going to them too. Um, how does it seem looking up now? You're looking up at the leaderboard, and you're not up there. I mean, little shell is Nick. He's part. He's, I mean, she must have learned a ton from you. We saw that in the last episode. <laughs> well, I, I gotta get him on. I spoke to his wife Chrissy on Facebook, so hopefully I can get Nick on the show. So we'll get it. We'll, we'll make it work. We'll make it work. But yeah. Uh, but uh, I was gonna say, how does it look looking up now? And time's running out. You guys, I know it's getting really, really close to quota time. And the North Boats are on top, man. That's got to be driving you crazy, right? Yeah, I mean, it does. I mean, I always want to be on top. But, you know, we had a tough year. And the thing that, that I like about it is Nick's top. You know, it's not .com. It's not, uh, it's not TJ. You know, it's not Buggins of all people. Uh, <laughs> I like him. I like Bobby, but it's on the bottom. He's got the Queens. The Queens, uh, it's... it's I, I never knew Bobby. Bobby never fished down here. How is he the South? How how is he the South? Help me out with that one. But he's, you know, he won one, you know, he had a great season one year in a row. So that's all I can say about him. But you weren't there. You weren't there. So that's the difference. I I was there. (laughs) No, 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 no. Wait, no, I understand. Now I'm talking like, now I'm talking like social media people. They got to understand. I'm focused on the show. I know you're always on the water. We know you're always on the water, but whatever. Just saying. But yeah. and, and hey, Bobby's a good guy. Um, he, they had some tough luck this year. There's no doubt. But hey, year after year, the top boats always rock. Up. The cream, the cream, the cream. Let's go to Facebook real quick. I got a Gene here. He wants to know what is your good luck charm if you have one. Um, Dirty hard work and dedication. We get up every morning and go to work. That's how we get lucky. That's it, man. That's it. That's. Oh. It. I mean, really, it's that simple. We yeah. bring bananas every day. Bananas, you're not you're not into that like different stuff, right? I know the bananas, the pineapples, the fruit. Uh, I'd eat the stuff. I don't understand. I, I, I mean, I, I see people like with sports. They put um, a jersey in a freezer. Like I mean, the Rangers are playing. Say I don't know, um, Pittsburgh and and uh, Sidney Crosby. I don't want him to score. You put a, you know, his 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 thing in a freezer and good luck. I think that you guys. <laughs> Your luck comes to you with hard work. That's your luck. It's going to pay off or not going to pay off, I guess, right? And, 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 and you know, this season we had some hard luck, but it wasn't my turn. You know, we it, it, it was my turn to have bad luck, you know. Uh, we, we had more – I had more screw-ups this year through nobody's fault. You know, it wasn't my fault. It wasn't my fault. There's a couple that are my fault, um, but it wasn't my mate's fault. It wasn't anything. It's just – it didn't go right. We didn't end it. And we had this first season we had like that. I lost more fish in one trip here 
than I lost in the last two years. It's just one. That's just the way it works out. It's just that we'll go one hundred percent. Nah. <laughs> I know I know exactly how it works, man. But I'm just playing along with the uh, people on uh, the Facebook groups and stuff like that. With that, uh, people want to know, like a lot of times, catching catching the tunas on there, we see it happening. But there's a lot of time that's not filmed. And uh, how do you how do you take that? And how do you become one with the camera in a way? Because when when something happens, they I guess they tell you to like kind of speak what's going on and stuff with on uh, with with yeah. you hook. They don't. Um, not real. No. Okay. Really okay. Get, you get. It all depends on the shooter you've got on the on the producer you've got on your on your boat. Um, he's the one who kind of dictates a lot of the mood, and I've had guys that are really pushy that are right in your face, asking questions, trying to make you do stuff. Not not. I don't mean trying to make yeah. you do stuff, but they're they're. They're trying to make things happen. You know, they want to make, all right, show me this, show me this, let's do that. What about this? What about that? Um, and I've had other guys that just sit back and watch and let you let us do what we do. Um, and then there's other guys that are a mix, you know, and the shooter that you have in your boat really makes you or breaks you um, because the only thing that the audience sees is what, your shooter shows them. You know what I mean? It's it's kind of hard because you can't have 100% coverage all the time. And some guys cover more than others. You know what I mean? Um, it's, it's, it's interesting. You know, I could see the different seasons where I had different guys on the boat and you look in a different light because they can only do so much with the footage they get. Do they do they affect your fishing at all in the beginning when you first got on? That it doesn't affect you fishing at all, right? No, no. The hmm. the funny thing was the first season, uh, the, one of the first days we went out, my shooter River, who was awesome, um, he gets up on the bridge. I'm going out the channel. He sticks a camera in my face. He says, "Okay, Captain, what's your plan today?" I'm like, "River, I need to get out the channel." He said, "Well, you better get used to this. I have to do it all. I have to do it all season." And and that's it. And that and that's where he's trying to get everything out of you. Um, and it makes you act a little bit. Um, it makes you push a little bit. But sometimes it gets you pissed off. It's like, get out of my face. I don't want to see this. You know, we're people. We got to deal with it all. Um, and, and and most of the shooters are really, really good. When you, when you get on the boat and you're fishing... I give them the speech right out the gate, no matter who it is. I said, look, when we're fishing, this is what we do. And if you're in the way, I'm going to push you out of the way. (laughs) Don't take it. That's not a shocker. It's not a shocker. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, don't take it to heart, but I need to be there to catch this fish. Oh my gosh. That's that. And most all of them are great about, um, you know, we had one guy one year who was, he had a, a camera on a pole. It was really rough. He had a camera on a pole, and he was holding it out the side trying to get the shot. And we, it, it, he got some awesome, incredible footage. It was rough as hell. The dart was right there, but we're like, you can't put it there. And we threw the dart, and the dot li- dart line grabbed the camera, and the camera went flying overboard. It, you know, it would have been great footage. Someone's going to find that camera somewhere. I'm like, holy shit, look at this. Uh, yeah, that was what it was it's caught. Gone. It was caught in the taking off. And then you can really see how these torpedo-looking beautiful creatures actually swim, man. Like, you would have had, like, one trailing the camera. I mean, that's... Uh, yeah. Yeah, because it's funny. All the guys say that. Like, we had um the guys, Ross the Rocket, they were saying that their cameraman was awesome in it. And it makes it so much easier, but no music. He said, I'm out there, I'm out there with no music. It's like, how could I fish with no music? Like, yeah. No, it makes it tough. You can't listen to the radio. You can't listen to Howard Stern. <laughs> yeah, but you got to listen to uh, Tyler on the radio, right? What's that like when you hear these guys? I mean, you always tune in together. I love Tyler. We're gonna have him on. Uh, I'm really. I give him. I give him props. I give them props because they make they make it look like anybody could do it. I, I, I. It's unfortunate. I know everybody cannot catch tuna fish, but him and his sister go out there and catch these giant tuna fish. And I'm like, I think me and Brian can get a boat, maybe a rowboat. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and go out there and try to catch these fish, but I doubt it. But you need, you need one smart guy, and Tyler's smart. Tyler knows how to catch fish, 
And, you know, it, it's funny. He played it out this whole year. Oh, me and my sister, and you guys got three guys. You got this. I'm like, Tyler, you know what? I'm 55 years old. When I was 30, I did it by myself. I did it with one guy, but I don't do it that way anymore. Um, and, and really, bluefin tuna fishing, it's not – it's hard work because you got to spend a lot of time out there, but it's smart work. You need to put – the right stuff in the water. You need to make sure your stuff's not going to break. And then when the fish comes to the boat, there's a system. You know, you can't just be like, oh, my God, we're gonna, here's the fish. we got to do this. You know, if you watch the show, you know, everybody has screw-ups of the boat. And every once in a while, it's like a Chinese fire drill. But overall, it's the same stuff. The fish comes up. You get a dart in them. You get a gaff in them. You get a tail rope. And... As long as you have one person on the boat that knows that that's what we have to do and you can keep the other people or the other person going along that line, you're going to catch fish. And, and Tyler's done that with Merm. You know, it's, it's, it's him and his sister. Um, you know, she's a pretty good angler. She's done well. But, you know, Tyler is a good fisherman. He's, he's always caught fish. And yeah. he knows what the fish are going to do. He's got a boat that you don't, you don't necessarily need a couple people to run because it's easy to get around on, and you know he succeeds. You know, catch fish. Now, explain his boat. Say, like his boat or Hot Tuna's boat compared to your boat. Uh, can you? What the, it's a totally different boat, right? Like he has a lot yeah. more room. Like you, like Bobby. Bobby doesn't seem like he's in in a, in a tuna fishing boat. It doesn't seem like you're no, out to catch tuna not. fishing that kind of boat, but. What's your boat like compared to this? My boat is built in 1977. It's a Billy Holton. Um, it was built right here in Manio on the Outer Banks for charter fishing. Okay. Specifically charter fishing out of Oregon Inlet. And our fishing is you run 35 miles, you troll, you take six people out. So... I've got a boat that has got a big enough salon to have six people comfortably sitting inside, hanging out. Um, the design of the hull is such that we can get through the inlet. The wave breaker type, yeah. I you was going to say. Yeah, you, I mean, you got a, we've got a big high bow. We've got a big flare. We've got a steep forefoot four, four to break the waves. And then she flattens out aft. So when we're running every day, but we're burning – 150 gallons of fuel a day, wow. you know, run 30 to 50 miles a day. Wow. So the boat is built to be more efficient with one motor. Um, it's not built to carry weight. It's built to go fast and troll and come home and get through the inlet. You know, I look at TJ's boat or dot com's boat or, or uh, not really Tyler, but TJ and dot com, their boats are battleships. They are. They're they are. big, yeah. heavy fiberglass boats yeah. with a big keel that don't go fast, but they can go through any kind of sea, and they're built to carry weight. You know, that that's what those boats are built for. They're not built for, you know, trying to catch one tuna fish. They're built for carrying 4,000 pounds, 5,000 pounds of fish in a day, or lobsters or, or what have you. Um, and to adapt them to the tuna boat is great because, you know, TJ's boat, it's a big, comfortable boat. And not so much here, but when you fish – up in New England, a lot of times it's, it's a war of attrition. You're going out there and you're spending days to try and get a bite. And the more comfortable your boat is where you can actually go to your galley, you know, cook dinner. You got a nice bunk to sleep in. You got big live wells. You got a big fish hole that, that holds plenty of ice, you know, where you can actually stay out there and instead of living on a center console for three days. <laughs> yeah, his boat uh, almost looks like a tugboat. It has that the, the big, you know, the big stern, the big back stern, you know. But, you know, it, it's a big boat. It costs money to run it. It costs money to operate it. You know, it's it's great off, you know, and that's the thing. Um, as far as running down here with their boats against ours, you know, one of my advantages, I, I have a bridge. So I'm 10 feet off the water. When I'm going through the inlet, I can see everything that's going on around me. I have a better chance to find a better hole to go through. 
And when we're fishing, same thing. I can see, I can see more of what's happening around me. You know, it's not like I'm down in a commercial boat and you're at water level trying to see, you know, what's going on around you. It's a lot easier for me. Yeah, when they show a head on of your boat coming at the camera, it's just like it, it looks so tall. The boat, like the hull, the hull is just so so much above water level in the front. You know, like it really looks like that boat. Your boat is a lot taller than the rest. Oh yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean it was it just it was built that way. Yeah, and it's actually one of the smaller boats in the fleet now. Okay. You know, when it was built in seventy seven. It was it was one of the bigger boats, one of the biggest, fastest boats in the fleet. But uh, nineteen seventy seven. It's only uh, I'm only two years older than your boat, man. Yeah, really. That's that's pretty much it. <laughs> Wow, what is it? Like, I, I see people have older boats, 1980s. How do you keep that boat ma maintained? I mean, that's got to be, like, something. I mean, oil changes all the time. Maintaining, how does that, that just has to factor into the business, too. I mean, this is a business, but that must be a tough one, right? It, it's nonstop maintenance. Um, and, you know, during the season when we're fishing every day, you got to you got to take care of your equipment. You got to take care of your mechanical stuff, your generator, your engine change oil, keep an eye on everything, make sure you don't have any leaks, and, you know, keep all of that running. Do you guys uh, have an off-season where you have to winterize? No. Like, like, we all have to winterize up here. We have to winterize our boats and, and, and seal them, you know, like pack them up. No, we keep going. We can, okay. we can fish all winter. Okay. You know, what, what I've done the last, well, I mean, pretty much since I've had the boat, I always take at least a month, and I go to the boat yard and go to work. Um, you know, I might like last year, I pulled the back windows out, um, replaced them, had a bunch of rot that I had to replace, you know, cut wood out, replace it with new wood, glass it back in, paint it. I painted the whole cockpit. That, that was my project last year. Huh. This year I've got, it's time for me to do a rebuild. So I'm actually, I found another engine. I'm replacing my engine this winter. Um, and it's every single year you got to do something. Because if you don't, it becomes completely overwhelming. Yeah. Well, I just want to know if you're actually doing any housework with your old man. Because I see on one episode, you said you want to spend more time with him. So have you been spending more time? Because he comes to visit you, and I feel bad, man. You know, he comes up to visit. Well, he's in Jersey. Oh, um, so I'm going to visit him. I'm in Rockaway. That's New York. We'll um, go visit him. Hang out. Say what's he, up. He, does, he has been down here a lot. You know, he comes down once in a while. Um... But this year was unique. I mean, I bought a house, and it was an old house that needed a lot of work. The location is awesome. I mean, I've got, like, right behind me, there's nothing but park service. It's awesome. The oh. beach is across the street from me. Um, but, you know, I had so I had this house, and I, my dad's a contractor. He's an electrician, and he's built a bunch of houses. And I said, look, I'm going to need some help. He said, oh, come down. He came down. He checked it all out, and he looked it over, and... He said, okay, it'll be a good good project. You know, you got to do this, you got to do that. And then he went back home, he got everything he needed, and we started going to work. Um, in the meantime, I went I went tuna fishing. We were filming the show, oh. so he was working his ass off every day, Daddy. That's mean. That's so mean, man. Like, come on. <laughs> He's seventy four. I gotta keep him. I gotta keep him going. Yeah, you know? but you gotta keep him busy. But also, he's seventy four. You should be hanging out with him more, man. Like, you know, wink. Well, I mean, come on. We we had you know when we're filming. Um, you gotta remember, we, it was winter time, and we didn't fish every day. We tried to fish every day, but the weather would would get us. And we had, I swear, all the days blend in now. Um, but I'm thinking this winter we we started filming around January 20th, and we're done by probably the 20, probably the 23rd, 24th of February maybe. Oh, and so wow, time, your season your season's very short, really. That that's real short. Yeah, it's really short. Wow. And in that time, we probably fished 20 days. So you know, we had a period of time. We had four or five days where it was blowing. We didn't make it. You know, we had time. Um, so I did. I did get to hang out with them. Okay. I got to make sure. I get to um, supervise them a little bit too, which was good. That's funny. He's moving your light switches around the house, right? Yeah, you know, Dad. I don't oh, want yeah. the light switch over there, Dad. I want the ceiling fan in the in the other room. But <laughs> no, the beach. Now living near the beach, North Carolina. We are Rockaway guys. I cannot live any way from the beach. I mean, I always say I want to get out of Rockaway. I want to move somewhere else. But I don't think I can leave the beach. What is it about us with the beach, man? 
Once you once you uh, live I, near the beach, you I, cannot move away. I don't go to the beach. You just go I mean, on top of it, like and it's like out nah, nah, and, and, and you don't go to yeah, the beach. But I mean, I don't go lay on the beach. I don't bring my beach chair down and hang out. Um, I'll go down there and you know walk across. I mean, I literally walk across the street and just go swimming, and I'll jump in the water, go for a little swim, and walk back home. Um, but it's so nice having it there. You know, I can look, I can sit up on my deck and look at the ocean. It's great. I mean, it's it's awesome. Now you say fishing, fishing. That's all you do is fish, right? What uh, what are, what other things do you do for fun? I mean, you like to cook. I see barbecue stuff all the time on your Facebook page. You throw some barbecue burgers up or something like that. Uh, what yeah, what well, does what does Greg like to do when he's not on the boat? Which is probably never. But what what, any, what fun do you like? Any football? Do you like baseball? I'm a Giants fan from way back. We had we had well, we didn't have season tickets, but my my um, my godparents had season tickets. Actually, his dad had tickets at the Polo Grounds, so he got season tickets at Giant Stadium. Coogan's Bluff. Coogan's Bluff, it was called. Coogan's Bluff. Eh? Yes, yes, yes. I heard. I, I loved. You know, anytime we talk about old historical baseball or football, I, I just love the old time. Like, I want to go to a time machine and actually go back to Ebbets Field. Just to walk through Ebbets Field. I mean, I, I'd want to uh, feel that. Like that would that'd be so cool. Or how would it feel to go out with um, I don't know, hundred years ago, tuna fishing with the captain on his boat, hundred years ago, like just, oh my to, God. just you know, go to go to Nova Scotia when when Zane Gray was going up there and catching those big bastards, and they didn't know anything. They had no internationals. They had no lever drags. It was just <laughs> tie yourself to the fish and pull on it. Wow. That's, awesome. that's funny because not only the other episodes with Paul, his father used to fish like that, man. The little boats and catch him in time. And I, that's oh, that, yeah. and that's crazy, man. That's some crazy, crazy stuff. But how the technology has changed over the years and the numbers. I asked everybody who comes on the captains, do you see a difference in the population over the last 10 years that you feel like maybe more than one fish possibly to – to help the quota and stuff like that. The, the way the fisher, the way the fishery is now, with the amount of boats that we have in it, we need to stay at one fish a day. Gotcha. Because for me, the longer the season lasts, the more we can make. Um, the main thing, the, the the main, the really big main thing that needs to be done. <laughs> is the commercial tuna fleet needs to be whittled down. There are boats that they come from everywhere. They get online, they get a $20 permit, and all of a sudden they're commercial tuna boat. They don't know how to take care of the fish. They've never caught anything before. They're not making any percentage of their income at all from commercial fishing. And it's just ruined the market. Do you think a lot of it has to do with the shows becoming so popular on TV? Like just any Tom, Dick, and Harry are like, you know what? I want to be a tuna fisher. I can't believe it's only $20 for a license. That's that's crazy. Well, you have to have commercial licenses in different states to sell the fish. But to actually get a bluefin tuna permit, a bluefin tuna permit to sell a fish is, I think it's a $20 permit. Um, and I've heard that argument a lot from people. Oh, the show has made this whole fleet of tuna fishermen. The guys that watch our show, the big fans that watch the show, are not going to go out and buy a boat and try and be a guy that can really do that are not watching me. They're going to seminars that other people are teaching, going, okay, I'll watch those guys catch them on TV. Now I'm going to go to the seminar or learn how to catch them. And that is a big problem. But the main thing is it's there's no there's no criteria for a commercial boat. Wow. You know, in any other fishery, I can't sell I can't legally sell a king mackerel because I can't get a permit because it's a limited access permit. Now, bluefin tuna are one of the high, most highly regulated fish in the world, and anybody can get a permit to sell one. It's so crazy. You know what's funny, How Greg? You you were coming on the show, right? And I'm checking out, and it's a little bit off topic, I guess, but I'm checking out YouTube, and they have these Asian fishermen, and I, I, they catch some kind of bluefish, and they're just pulling them out, pulling them out. Like the one guy spraying the the chum, or 
Either, either um, skipjacks in or yellowfin. I couldn't. Or Probably not bluefin either. No, skipjacks. Obviously not bluefin because you ain't pulling a bluefin over like that. I, I get that. I, I get that. Well, you do the small ones you do. Really? But that's probably in the Pacific. Probably, like I say, either skipjack or or yellow fins. I saw that yeah. and I got so upset. Like I just seen like I know that they they eat a lot of fish in Asia and stuff like that. But I mean, come on. I mean, it's got to be taken like that. But but that is a hook and line fish. Oh. It's selective. So what? They're, what not, a- they're not taking a net and surrounding the whole school and catching them all. Those fish are making a. Ch- it's it's hard to say it this way. Okay. Um, okay. We uh, fish intelligent. The fish are making a choice to eat. <laughs> they don't have to eat. And it's not because there's so many guys that are there that are doing it. The only reason they're catching the fish is because there's so many fish there. The fish are so competitive. They've got to eat that hook before the guy next to them does. It's and amazing. And they're done and they quit biting. There's a ton of fish that are down below them that you don't even see. Oh, I got you. I got you. I got you. So it's a little misleading. It's misleading, I guess. And it's right. I, I didn't compare it to net fishing where – you catch all kind of species, even mammals, whatever they're catching and they're dying. But yeah, it but didn't seem that, right. And it doesn't. It doesn't seem right. And that's that's one of the major problems we have with commercial fishing these days. Um, the public perception is that a commercial fisherman rapes the. Earth. And when you talk about gill nets, you know the CCA puts these billboards up with a picture of a gill net and it says it's a wall of death and they show turtles and birds and all kinds of fish in it. You you wouldn't believe it until you see it, but a a gill net is very, very selective. An eighth inch difference in mesh from a, from a three and a half inch to a three and five eighths mesh will catch a completely different size fish. And you know, hook and line fishing is like that. You know, long line fishing, our, our, our long line fleet in the U.S. has gone through so many different regulations, and they're so highly regulated. They're so highly monitored. It's very, very, very clean fishing. You know, they have limited bycatch. And even if they put a 1,000 hooks out there and they strung it through a fish of, strung it through a school of, of a 1,000 fish, they're not going to catch all of them. You can't catch all of them. This is a hook and line. They're coming to it, and they're going to look at it. They're either going to eat it or they're not. Um, and the other ones are going to swim away. And and that's one of the biggest problems that we have now because there's so many environmental groups that are against commercial fishing because they look at it as factory fishing. They look at it as raping the ocean. And what happens in the United States is we import 90% of our seafood. The seafood, generally all the seafood we catch in the United States is highly regulated. You know, there's always oversight. There's very little bycatch. There's very little waste. But then we import from all these other countries that have no regulations we have. You know, go completely over the, they go over the top with everything. And then they send it here and they sell it cheaper. And that's why our fishermen can't make a living here. And, and it's it's sad, but most people don't realize that. You know, there's people in this world that are like, oh, man, I'm going to buy those shrimp because oh, those shrimp are $2 a pound. Yeah, they came from Japan. They came from China. They're farm-raised. I'm not going to buy these 350 pound shrimp that were caught yesterday in the sound right here behind me because I can get them for $2. But they don't see the whole picture. It's It's amazing. It really is. It's kind of funny because we had a guy that owned a local butcher store, right? And he was talking about the meat, about how his prices of meat being a certain price because they're actually farmed in the United States. Um, a lot of times when you go to Walmart or you go to these other places, the food is brought in from Greenland or it's, it's everywhere. Fr- yeah, everywhere there is. And it's frozen a second later and it's brought to you as fresh for $1.99 at Walmart because you can buy the whole package of it. Um, I think that has to be brought out to people to be uh, aware of that. I mean, I didn't know. I mean, obviously, you could take common sense and say the $2 shrimp are probably raised, but I never thought about that, to be honest with you. I'm dumb the dumb consumer that sees. They see the price. Everyone sees the price. Yes. And 
you think about it in in today's day and age where we talk about the farm to table movement you know you go to the local um the local um food stand the local vegetable stand and you buy local vegetables because you know you're talking about transportation costs and they're growing them here it's a small guy it's that the seafood market's the same thing and most people don't see it you know on this beach we've got millions of people that come down here every year probably had four million tours here this year um restaurants up and down the beach a lot of the seafood that they get is imported it comes from Sam Rust. It comes from Cisco. It comes from these big food suppliers that bring it down here because it keeps the food prices cheap. You know, it keep the it keeps the food costs down. And if you can keep the food costs down, you're making more money in your bottom line. But you're not supporting a local. You're not supporting a local fisherman. No, and that's that, important. And that's where it needs. That's where a lot of people need to look at, like with our bluefin, for instance. The prices that we get on bluefin now, where we used to get big, big money, you know, the average price now is not nearly what it used to be. But if instead of worrying about shipping those fish to Japan, and we had a local market or we had more people in the United States in a domestic market that said, okay, this is a local, you know, sustainable fishery. Let's, let's use these fish. Instead of buying Arctic char from from uh, Iceland or or buying imported big eye from damn Indonesia, so how you do know? you stop that, Dad? Greg, how do you stop that? How do you take the first step to stopping education. on education? Okay. Um, and and we've been working on it for a while. You know, I belong to North Carolina Watermen United. I'm a, I'm a board member on there. I'm I'm on two different advisory panels um, for not necessarily bluefin, but for highly migratory species. And we talk about it all the time. And the main thing to, to keep American fisheries sustainable is education. You know, let people know that, you know, you, you want to buy some, some trout. Well, it's coming from my buddy, Andrew Barry, who's got a 16 foot skiff. He's never been in the ocean in his life. He's made his entire living in the sound catching fish a little bit at a time. You know, he catch, he fished with gill nets, mostly with gill nets, with gill nets and pots. And, you know, he's been regulated out of it. He's catching, you know, a good day he might catch a thousand pounds of fish, wow. but he's catching enough to sustain himself and to sustain, sustain his family. But he can't sell them for the price he used to get. Because there's so much important stuff coming in, you know. It, it's and most people will go for the cheaper price, and that's that's a problem. It's a big problem. Now, how, do local restaurants. Do you supply any local restaurants that you've been supplying for years? Do people do, do do people go there more because maybe it's better food or how do you get that that? I mean, I know where I want to visit. You want to go to a restaurant, Brian. You want to go where the, where, the, where the food is the best. It's you're not really worrying about price, I guess. But to the point where you. Like, Price, I guess, has to come into the factor in any kind of business. Oh. It's not even just, but it's not even just fishing. It's, it seems like America doesn't make anything no more. Like it's nothing. We don't like we were built on, uh, you know, our, our, our making our skills and all. But now we we're too busy to go to Amazon to get a T-shirt. Or I, I can't explain it to you. It's like it's totally oh, no, you, you, so much. Yeah. Are oh, you so, breaking up a little bit? Yeah, probably. Uh, am. Well, no, and that. Like we we do have several um, local restaurants that will use nothing but local fish, and they actually put the name on the menu of who caught it, oh, and cool. people, and they charge a little bit more, but they do excellent report, you know, really good portions. They make awesome food, and hey, people pay for quality. There's no doubt. I'm curious the um that the 660 pound that you caught, I think it was season five, right? Um. Well, maybe no. It might actually was before that. Catch them all the time like that, man. But uh, no. Pounds. Well, that well that one. The... We caught two fish on my boat. They were that big. Okay. I caught okay. A 60, and we caught a six sixty nine. Um. It was the. I think it was the year before we were done filming that. So okay. we. Are you right? Now right. the one the one six hundred the one the one six hundred and sixty one you got that that was on the show you got twenty five a pound for that. Yeah. Was that was that when prices were higher or was that fish really just that perfect? I mean, the guy said that was the most perfect 
winter blue uh, blue he's ever seen. It was a really good fish. Okay. Yeah, I mean it was it was really a nice fish. I mean that was with sixteen seventeen thousand dollar pay on that on that one fish. Yeah, sometimes they're worth that. And <laughs> even more sometimes. Wink, that, wink, Greg. Uh, sometimes more than that. Wink, wink. You know, that, I know. Is that the most you ever got a, a per pound though? Like or, or or like do we not see it all? On the show. On the show. On the show. No, that was that was the biggest that, that was the biggest paycheck I ever got. It was okay. Wow. Yeah, well, these Japanese man, they love they love these blue, these bluefin man. I mean, these guys go crazy over this man. Yeah, the, the thing the thing is now, um, you know, they like wild caught fish. There's no, but we're competing against farm raised fish that they can get a beautiful farm raised fish all day, all year long. So they're even more critical of our fish now. No difference. You can't like you can tell the difference of I I, no. You oh, I, wow wow. No, I, I couldn't tell the difference. I'm sure people can, um, but I can't. So these tuna, they can farm raise tuna like that? I didn't think it was possible. They do. Yeah. Wow. wow. I didn't and think it was possible. Doing, they've been doing it for probably, I, I guarantee it's been over 20 years, 20, 25 wow. years. And it's gotten to the point now that that's, that's probably the biggest market for bluefin is farm raised. Wow. I yeah, no, I would never think that either. Never, never think would think that. in a million years. I, I, I think of like salmon or um, some kind of fish like that, maybe. Yeah, but you, you got to remember, it's a major, major investment. I mean, you need a lot of area. You need a lot of equipment. Um, and I, I still can't understand how they can make money doing it, but they do. They're still in business. Wow. They're still rolling. Uh, 50 years from now, say, right? Would the people be still going out of the out of banks to catch these tunas? Absolutely. Okay. Well, I can't say that absolutely because you know, fifty years ago, we they were using them for they were using them for cat food, right? Well, yeah, no, they were they were still they were selling them, but I mean, fifty years ago, sixty years ago, New Jersey was the bluefin capital of the world. Three L. I mean, they were there, and they're not. Oh, they're there now, but it, it's all slightly cyclical. So ten years from now, we may not have a bluefin here. You don't know, you know, it's all cyclical and, and, um, but Hey, I'd love, I'd like to think that 50 years we'll still be catching them here. Well, let's hope so. That's awesome. And we'll, we'll let you go. It's uh we had about an hour worth with you. Um, but I appreciate it, man. You coming on, taking the time out tonight and, and actually school me on these uh, tunas and stuff like that. I was actually trying to post one up now. I had a picture of one and there's one. Yeah. It's up here right now. Right. And the way it looks, like a football, right? If people at home can see right now. I mean, the, this picture, this thing yeah. swimming through the water, and it's got scrapes on it. I wonder what's scraping. I guess they're, they're banging into each other or something like that. Who knows? Who the, wow. Very interesting fish, man. They're awesome. They're awesome creatures. I, I used to catch the porgies. I used to catch the porgies, man. They're like the three-inch porgies. <laughs> and fill yeah. them up with buckets. My mom used to work in the city. So the Spanish ladies, my mom was a, was a chambermaid. She's a maid. She cleans the rooms. The Spanish ladies, you know, you, uh, Billy, Billy, bring the porgies because uh, they love them. They love the porgies. Uh, yeah. Oh, it was great. But the little ones, little ones. We used to catch so many of them. And I don't know that the, the activists are really going to get mad at this. We used to throw them on the road or the bridge, <laughs> right? Because you were kids. We didn't know. We had a bucket full of them. Uh, throw them on the road and they would cause a run by <laughs> like a ketchup package and it would just splat. That's not good. That's You're not cruel, good. Man. Nah, You're cruel. Right. kids are cruel. Kids are cruel. All right, but I don't want to be there. I had one guy say, "Why do you always get on your your, your mates? Why are you so hard on your mates on the show?" But but I don't want to give him too many questions. I'm really, you know what? I'm really not. It seems I, like you are. Well, I expect a lot out of them, and and they know what to expect, and they've been with me long enough. They know exactly what it is. But um, when things go wrong, I want to make sure they know it. Hey, you're That's the all. boss, man. You sign the checks, right? You are the boss. I, I, checks. You it's sign business. the checks, it's man. Right. It's a business. I let a lot. I let a lot of things go until it built to a head. Last, didn't. last thing before we let you go tonight. Any possible way you can get towards the top in the end of the of season? Is there possible? Season ain't over yet. Okay. <laughs> I expected that answer, but here's <laughs> Captain. Greg Mayer, man, I appreciate it. Wicked Tuna out of bank season. Well, the champion. This guy is like 
Rick Flair of uh, Wicked Tuna. Like, he always has the belt. But this season, <laughs> it may seem to be knocked off the top. But not to really bug him. But the, that tuna dance, right? That has got to be the dumbest thing. And I, Bobby, I love you, and I want you on the show. But the tuna dance, that was not really the... <laughs> <laughs> it's not the macarena. I ain't gonna catch you on like that. But uh, thank you so much. <laughs> it's about as tasteless as the underwear model. Yeah. Well, he, he never modeled underwear. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the only good thing I heard, like for people still watching, that Borat is coming out with a new show. So that's gonna be pretty funny. 2020 is not a total waste. Uh, thank you so much, Captain, Greg, and uh, be safe out there, man. Be safe. Uh, you got it. Good luck for the rest of the season, Greg. Thank you very much. I appreciate it, man. Thank you. I'll have you back on. We'll do we'll do it again. We'll do it again. Definitely right. will. Thank you so much. Thanks everybody right. for tuning in. I'll see you. Thank you very much, man. Thank you so much for tuning in to Buck the System with uh Buck and my man Fox. One thing before we go. This, um yeah. one one quick thing. I just want to thank two people. Uh Christina Palermo, Nikki Marie. Um, who were kind enough to help us and donated the uh, mixer for us. Uh, guys, so appreciated. Such a nice thing for you guys to do. So we just wanted to say thank you. Um, you guys do a great service with the uh, thing that you do. And, um, again, I just wanted to say thank you very much. It's helping the show, and we love the new mixer. Yeah, it's awesome. Thank you so much. Um, you know what the funny thing is? I said about Borat, and I have to bring the Borat back. You watch the trailer. Go t- go to YouTube and check out the new Borat trailer for part two. I was pissing my pants. It was the funniest thing. Uh, Borat, at one point, he goes, we'll uh, he goes oh, what do you like the most, uh, the, the virus or Democrats? And the guy was like, Democrats. Uh, but <laughs> well, yeah, well, check it out. But thank you so much. And honestly, this is really good because we're going to try to get Nick on. I have um, spoke to uh, Green Bay Packers. Running back, 1997 running back, Dorsey Levins is going to come on the show. So that's a pretty good score. Get to talk to him where he played with Brett Favre, which he sucked as a Jet. But he had a shoulder, whatever, whatever, whatever. Jets suck. They're probably losing tonight anyway. Don't even tell me. If they lose tonight, they probably will not win another game this year. Gase must go. Um, anything else? Joe Douglas has got to find talent. But thank you, Fox. Tune in Thursday night. We'll be back Tuesday night. Guest, I'm not sure yet, but we're working on it. But thank you so much for checking it out. We had Captain from the Fish and Frenzy, and hopefully he can climb his way to the top of the leaderboard and out of banks. But I like Tyler too because they're gonna come on. So Tyler's cool. I like I mean, whatever. But uh, he almost, you know, did that like uh, Bobby did like a guillotine choke out last episode. He's like hanging on. He's going up to my uh, whatever. But anyway, now, now Bobby's not gonna answer my messages now yeah, because I'm talking about it. that. But anyway, thank you so much and. Um, New episode of Wicked Tuna Sunday. I believe it's 9 p.m. Eastern Standard right. Time. Matt Geo. Matt Geo. One time when I first started the show, I was like, yeah, and he's on um, Discovery, right? Discovery Channel. I'm like, <laughs> you dumb, dumb, bum, bum. Uh, but there is a fuck. Well, always ask about Discovery Channel. I'm like, no. Nah. Matt Gio. I would Matt never Gio. mess that one up again. Yeah. I would never mess that one up again. There is a Fox song. I was checking out Fox. You ever see that Fox song? But them. we're going to come back anyway. What I wanted to try next episode was I want to go into Fox's phone and play, um, what is it, like, um, just clacking out over here. You hear the echoing. But I want to play his uh, shuffle. I'm going to go into his songs and shuffle it five times, and I want to see what comes up on his phone, and we'll do the same with mine because I think it's kind of interesting what kind of music people listen to. You can really find out a lot about them. I want to hit his phone next time, and we're going to hit it. I'm going to hit this um, shuffle button. And then it we'll works. see what comes out. We play a couple seconds of it. That works. And then we'll see what's up. You can't set it up either. You cannot set up your phone to come in to a certain shuffle. I'm going to go into songs and we're going to see. All right, everybody? And that debate, we will not be talking about it. you like me to talk about the debate? No. I would like to talk about the debate. No. But no politics and no religion. So That's we right. can't talk about that, that here. That, yeah. But thank you so much and have a good night, everybody. Don't forget to check out the Tuna thank Sunday you. night. Thank you. Have a good night, guys. Have a good night. All right. See you. Thanks for listening to Buck the System. Next time, Buck Gritano will do it all again, and we hope you'll join us for the ride. In the meantime, you can reach out to us at buckthesystempodcast at gmail.com. With questions, comments, suggestions, we'd love to hear from you. Our email address again is buckthesystempodcast at gmail.com. We'll see you next time on Buck the System.